one way in which the ideas about globalization are so devastating to the idea of labor power. It, ha it has to do with the way in which neoliberal globalization weakens the promises of democracy. The other way is that it is the ideas and some of the realities, but not all of them, are devastating to the old, old idea that labor power is the power to shut it down. Because globalization means the shift of the mass production industries to Asia and to the global south. And with that shift of investment comes intensified competition, goods competition, uh, with the consequence that workers, unionized workers often in the developed world are constantly being whipsawed against workers in the global south. So the idea is, and a lot of union people have said this to me, including union intellectuals, that we can't strike under these conditions. You can't strike. You can't talk about strike. You can't talk about strike. You can't talk about the essential exercise of labor power, which is the power to shut it down. The power potential at the bottom, in particular, is not automatically expressed. A lot of strategic work has to do to be done to realize that power. For one thing, people who are subordinated, who are culturally suffocated, have to come to recognize that they are important, that they are making contributions. Much of the work of labor organizers over the century has been about just that showing workers, telling workers, encouraging workers to see that it's they who build the railroads. You know, there were songs like that. It's we who till the prairies, build the railroads, da 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 da. Labor has been much slower, labor leaders. They're too bureaucratic, they're too comfortable. Their old ways of doing things worked or partly worked, they never worked wonderfully. They're timid, they're old, they're fearful of the risks of new strategies which involve breaking rules. So in the United States, it isn't that labor hasn't recognized that they're in big trouble as they lose members and lose density. They do, they know that. And there have been shifts in leadership but not dramatic, dramatic. And what those new leaders have tried to do is they've tried to revive, to put more energy into old strategies, a kind of old repertoire. Our model could be the manifesto, but the manifesto, the communist manifesto, was really too general for the purposes that we have, that we need to put the strategic work to today. We, we want to face off against neoliberal propaganda. And that means that we have to do academic work about why the precariat or other workers who are not quite so precarious, but they probably will be, why they have power, why the unfolding of inter, inter, the growth of international markets without opposition resistance, without spinning off concessions to working people of any consequence, why this is not inevitable. We need to study in a way that the manifesto did not, could not, how people can be organized in the face of the more dispersed character of contemporary sites of labor. We need new forms of organization. We need to learn more about, to explain how people with diverse languages, diverse traditions can be brought together because they always were brought together. That's what the history 
of labor is about. It's about bringing people from diverse locales with diverse uh, languages or dialects, diverse ideas, bringing them together. But the promise of power is a heady promise. And it does unite people, despite the barriers of language and tradition, and despite diverse terms of employment. That's what our history is about, and we ought to continue to make history. Thank you.